One of the things I think we all love about our industry is the opportunity to solve complex problems or issues. Like doctors, like surgeons, we diagnose and we treat or prescribe the right solution. Maybe it's a process, maybe it's a technology, but we do so to keep our organizations healthy and safe. And that feeling we get when we finally fix something, that sense of accomplishment, that pride, that we have protected our organizations. But every now and then, that thing you thought you fixed is still there. And it begins to fester. That sense of pleasure and accomplishment becomes pain. The pain of it sticking in your side like the thorn that it is. Such is the case for user authentication and the menace of credential sharing. Like an ache or a pain, it just won't go away. Well, we have a treat for you today. Welcome to our surgical suite because we've hand selected the perfect panel. With over half a century of cyber experience combined and our objective, a desired outcome, it's simple. To extract with surgical precision once and for all this thorn from all our sides. And let's get started. Join me in welcoming Mark Dillon, Theo Van Wick, and Luke Roy. And let's start with Mark. Mark, why don't you take the opportunity to introduce yourself to the broader audience? and help us really understand, really diagnose, why is sh credential sharing such a menace or a problem? And what is the risk to our organizations? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Daniel. Uh, and that, that speech, which may have been perceived as melodramatic or even maybe comedic by intention, it, it actually is not that far off for me. So I'm the VP of IT for Waterloo Hydro, and uh, one of my responsibilities is overall cybersecurity. If anyone ever heard about a hack happening at my utility, I would be one of the people interviewed. And so one of the things I have to worry about is making sure that doesn't happen, or, or more precisely, when it does happen, that the investigation proves at least we did our best due diligence. And one of those things would be not having people log into a bunch of computers with you know, username PC1, password PC1, because they're sharing it, because they have to do something around that. And when I see that stuff, it drives me nuts. It gets me yeah. um, uh, unprofessionally upset, because <laughs> there's almost no excuse for it. But it happens everywhere. Yeah. And the, the menace of it is you don't even have traceability on your insider threats. Uh, you have a uh, lax security profile. And all of the good stuff you did, like you said, you installed some new appliance, you made something more secure, it's completely undone by that practice. It, it undermines yeah. it at the foundation. Luke, let's bring you in. Given your experience, your expertise and your background, um, again, please introduce yourself and I'd like your insight on why it's such a, a problem or a menace to our organizations. Well, I'd, I, I'd like to add to what Mark is, and, and I feel like a sure. little bit of a psychologist here because just hearing Mark, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, and, and you, it, it is actually a major menace, and yeah. it's quite profound. So I'm Luke. Um, I am the CIO at Laurentian University, the AVP of uh, Information Technology, and um, we have strong stance uh, related to um, you know, sharing credentials and so on. One of the things people don't realize, and I'll touch on a different perspective, is that who selects the password, for example? Well, by selecting whoever the person who selects the password, culturally, you're probably going to suggest something that you're probably using somewhere else, or you're probably actually associated to something of, of that's going to say something about you, like your name of your dog. So, oh, we know you're a dog lover. And, and that gives, again, more um, opportunities for somebody who's malicious for the password to even do something beyond just, just trying to crack 
uh, you know, uh, a system. It may go on your personal side and so on. So there's a lot of reasons, and, and, and I echo what Marcus said, and I just want to give kind of a, a social perspective of why this is, um, of course, uh, this is a bad thing. Perfect. And Theo, I'd like to bring you in, given your industry unique perspective, um, weigh in. Absolutely. So Theo Van Wyk, uh, head of cybersecurity and solutions development with CDW. Uh, just, you know, I've had 20, just over 20 years of cybersecurity experience. And so we started right back when the whole concept of security was an IP address and a host. And that was really it. And it was behind a locked door. Um, and having seen how it has evolved over time has been incredible. But the reality is when I look at how we construct security systems today and, you know, it's it's tough to go after these fine gentlemen because they've they've coined it so well. So I'll try to add a little bit to it. But the reality is everything I'm building for both for us CDW and for our customers and organizations we work with comes back to that ability to identify the user. Like that is how I and we'll talk we'll obviously dive into this, but this is how I define everything in my security going forward is how do I identify who you are and then take the appropriate steps from there. And so when we run into things like credential sharing, you know that is a that is imposter like that that blinds you to it effectively, um, and it undermines so many of the of the controls that we're putting in place. But the reality is, you also have to think about the balance between uh, making something secure and making something usable. And as cybersecurity professionals, that is the number one thing you learn: is the more secure you make something, generally the less usable it becomes for an end user, and it becomes finding that right balance. Right? And so when you look at that psychology and how humans operate, and to your point, people are moving fast. Um, there's certain, psychologically, we're pre-wired to take certain paths. Then credential sharing is not something that should surprise us, but I love the surgical analogy. It is absolutely painful, and yes, definitely, it frustrates us. Yeah, I, I just want to so, touch on something that Luke said quick, is that he was talking about um, <clears throat> the idea that your personal life has somehow intertwined yes. in here. And what we've seen actually, a lot of corporate hacks that have happened have been someone's you know, web form password dump. So if you have a habit of, you know, here's my password that I use for this, here's my password that I use for a little more, oh, this is the one I use for my bank stuff, right? Which maybe is the same one you use for your LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn has had how many password leaks over the last couple of years? And then the first thing someone do, so they will do when they get your email address is they'll say, I wonder if they're this bank, that bank, this bank. I wonder if I can get into their work systems. So something, even sharing, not among other people, but across systems yeah. is, it, that's the next level to worry about once you can stamp out the people sharing each other's passwords. That credential stuffing attack vector where they're just spraying and testing passwords, they know. Yeah. So let's, let's expand on that, Mark. So from a solutions point of view, uh, what are some of the solutions out there? And what must we be doing better as, as an industry? Well, so the, the first thing is uh, whatever you can, avoid having people remember 15 different places, right? So right. password okay. managers are great tools, right? You know, things like uh, uh, Bitwarden or OnePass or, or whatever it is that you choose your flavor that's good. That's nice, but it's painful to use. So minimizing the amount of different credentials people have to manage is one of the best things you can do. And that's not easy because People don't think of identity as one of the foundations, but when you're building your server room or you're renting your services, switches, racks, et cetera, identity is one of those layers that's just as fundamental. And as soon as you start to do it differently than that, it'll sprawl. And then you, your business may have like 11 ERP systems that have different cloud identity management, and then some of them will tie into your 365, and some of them will tie into your whatever, and some of them will have their own logins. They'll all have different password policies, they'll all have different expiries, and that sprawl causes people to just say, you know what, here's the password I'm going to use on all these different systems. Right. So Luke, from an educational point of view, um, how, do you, how do you balance that difference between you know, security and usability? So, so for, for us, we, we, you know, you, you've asked Mark, you know, what, what the solution, well, you know, kind of ints on the solution. The first thing is, is probably don't do it. <laughs> so, you know, if you can prevent it, don't do it. Um, what we've done at Laurentia University is we took it on IT to figure out a way that we don't do it. So therefore, we only have one password to access all of our systems. In fact, that's, that's not really 100% true. 
There's a secondary system which has more access. The auditors told us, you need a different password. So probably a good issue to have. So as an IT professional, and I'm sure some of you are out there, or, or many of you are people that influence IT, put the onus on IT to figure out a way to prevent credential sharing. Um, we, we're doing it through uh, a central authentication system. I know it's difficult. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, traditional systems don't allow you, so I get that. But if they allow you to, put the onus on IT to make sure you don't do credential sharing, is basically. And, and so for us, we even put a policy that you can't. So um, again, for all the positive reasons why you don't want to do it. So putting the onus on IT on to not share credentials. I mean, it kind of sounds like now we're talking about, you know, the people process or technology issue. So which one of those things should we be concentrating on first? Theo? So I'm going to go with it. It depends. It's the, the gold standard of security <laughs> questions that drives people insane some days. But the reality <laughs> is, and, and, you know, just look, you, you coined it so well, it's, um, and I've heard all the different parts come out between a technology and people and process, right? You have to right size it for your organization and for what you're using it for. Uh, too often do we see customers trying to shoehorn their business either into a compliance framework or to a form of policy that they've just trade adopted or picked up from somewhere. And you know, at best, you're going to achieve that at one moment in time. But the moment you get up tomorrow, and you mentioned that, Mark, the moment you get up tomorrow and you start working then you're, you're violating that. Again, you're moving out of that because it wasn't designed, it wasn't aligned with how you operate. And so I think, you know, the, the other part on that, pro the people part that you touched on as well, you have to put the onus on the user, but you have to do it in a way that they understand that if their credentials leak, it, there's a reputational thing here. Like the network, if the systems are going to think that it is you. Like somebody has impersonated you and, they're, and what they're doing reflects on potentially on your character and there's impact from that. And it's, it's not fear-mongering, it's that awareness. You know, you mentioned earlier the, the cross-section between personal and digital. Uh, we talk about be, being a good digital citizen at CDW. That's really important for us, is that training part to make people understand that the same things that hold true for corporate is also true for personal. And as a whole, build that hygiene, be a better person. And so, Daniel, I think the coming back to your question is that you have to look at where your organization is. If you don't have the technologies, People and process will only get you so far. Um, you need a foundational layer of technology, and we, we can dig into you know single sign-on, MFA, different credential stores. Like there's all the goodness that we can wrap around that. Um, but then if you don't train your people on how to use it, and there you know there comes the policy process portion of it, and then give them personal ownership, like make them realize that they're your first and last line of defense. Um, and so there's no easy answer for this one, Daniel. But I think you know you balance and you find what works, and you're gonna. Talk at the different sides until something takes and you see progress. I think, just to add to Theo's point, I think Mark and I will probably going to have a different perspective on this because we have, uh, w one is educational and the other one is utility, practically. And, and we all have our own system. So my experience has been to answer what Theo said. Theo, Theo's right because he's sitting, there's a reason why he's sitting between us, because he's right in the middle. <laughs> it really depends. <laughs> Uh, what we did is we focused on the people first. Um, okay. For right or wrong, um, we didn't have all the technologies in place, so that's probably a reason why. But I realized when we focused on the people first, we were able to you know, train them, acclimatize them to the cybersecurity risk, make them understand why it's a good thing not to share credentials, make them to the point where they don't want to. So now they're asking, putting the onus on IT, uh, writing policies like a uh, acceptable user po uh, acceptable use policy, that's important. Again, uh, I'm I'm happy with the path that we've taken because um, that the, our, our our social environment at Laurentian has been really good in adopting really good practices for cybersecurity. Let me let me add to what you said there. So I, I actually agree with you on the people process technology. Uh, and then, and then we don't do it. So people, if you do a technology first, then you dictate the process by how it works, and then the people don't like it. So when you say, then they won't want to share passwords, it's like, well, why did they want to in the first place? Well, there's two reasons. One, it's difficult and annoying to manage this correctly. And two, uh, not just authentication, 
but also authorization is another component to this. How onerous is it when you change from one role to another while someone's on vacation that day or whatever to not just give them your password versus what's the request time look like for them to be designated instead of to do that job correctly as an alternative? Uh, and then when, of course, the other person gets back, do we ever actually remove those privileges? So I think ease of use is, is like, so a simple example. I never thought I would use biometrics. I, I'm sort of ideologically opposed to using them as an identity method. But as soon as my phone had a fingerprint reader, whatever, it's easy, easy, right? So now I can log into my bank, I can log into, you know, I can open my phone quickly, then I can have a stronger screen password instead of just a four digit one. So ease of use changes it completely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just to go between again here, I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, I think a lot of the important part for us and, and you know, working with organizations um, as customers, but also just in general as security practitioners, is I found the value in articulating the intent. I think we've created, over many years, IT has created a culture of telling people how it's going to be. And to your point, it started from a technical f foundation and we expected people to mold how they behave to that. Um, and it's not the right, it's, that is not necessarily the right approach. There may be areas, but I found as soon as you can communicate the intent behind something and people then understand their part in that, their role and how important that is, it's not the silver bullet, but I, that goes a lot further than putting a policy in front of somebody and just saying, thou shalt follow the policy. Yeah, do you remember the apology letter from NIST about their password policy? <laughs> they, they, went from, they went from 8 to 13 with special characters change often to, we're sorry, actually, more than 14, never change it, no other rules. Yeah. And, and, and Theo, I, I want to give you kudos for saying this because, you know, uh, knowing the intent also allows you to figure out the past and so on. So acting as a consultant is really important on something like this. So, so kudos on you. Perfect, thanks. And I think what I'm hearing is, and I agree with all three of you, you know, there's a, a massive difference between uh, writing a policy or piece of governance in an ivory tower and then just disseminating it and really including uh, our, our employees or our coworkers as part of that journey and having them paint that final painting with us. So they feel part of the process where something is being done with them and not to them. I'd like to build off of something that uh, Mark said. Um, so yeah, it might be true that, you know, um, some people in organizations are sharing credentials, but I also think it's possible that um, not all of those sharing of the credentials are driven by malicious intent, that there could be constraints within the organization, such as financials, an example, where they haven't given the right tools or the right solutions to their people. So they feel in order to get their jobs done, they have no choice. So I was just wondering what your perspective is around, you know, the constraints within an organization and how that might drive the kind of behavior that isn't ideal. Right, so the place, when you say that, the thing I think about most is uh, <clears throat> the, the seat cloud licensing creates an incentive to share credentials. And businesses that aren't accustomed to that month over month operating expense, and I can tell you the electricity industry is very uh, incentivized to do capital spends. So when someone says it'll cost you $8 a month, it's like, oh, okay, per user. Oh, that's a game changer for us, right? That's, that's either we're not gonna use that service or if we've got five or six people that need to use it, the temptation will be, well, we'll share the account and we'll create some centralized mailbox for it. But now you don't know who did what in that service. And so that's something I've been explaining and working with people on saying, I get it costs a little more, but trust me, it's worth the investment. And once you explain it, people will typically get that. But there's business processes that aren't just financially incentivized. Uh, visibility, for example, authority, distributed authority in small companies where you want to have two roles, have to sign off on something. But sometimes one person's not there because you're so small. Right. And, and uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to add uh, a little bit to that is that in a university setting, uh, the, it's hard for us to uh, implement one account for multiple people because licensing mechanism for the learning management and so on is really intended for the user, not multiple users. So there's a, there's a certain, uh, you know, policies or there's a certain, um, 
you know, um, what you sign with the vendor itself um, that you have to follow. So that also helps our case because then we're able to socialize the fact that per user is actually a, a reality cost. And our, our costs maybe are, uh, in some cases, are not as uh, ex extenuous, uh, I'll say, than others. So, so we... Anyway, it's, 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 it's interesting to hear, Mark, because the dynamics, depending on the industry, are, very, are, are a little bit different. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I think from my perspective, it's absolutely interesting to hear the two sides, right? Uh, we talked about communicating intent to the end user. I think there's also a communicating intent and understanding up to the board level and to the C-suite, right? And I think, the, but for that, you have to translate to risk. And you have to explain what the risk is that's being signed off. And because at the end of the day, nobody has unlimited funds, right? We're balancing what we're going to spend versus the risk that we're mitigating. And I think you have a really good example there that says, yes, can I save, you know, used $8 a month? And I know it's a fictitious number, but, you know, if I do that over 10 people over 12 months, that's not even a thousand, it's barely a thousand dollars. But here's the risk that you're introducing to the organization by saving a thousand dollars. Is that worth it in this scenario? And you know, the reality is maybe the maybe they will sign off on it and as security professionals then occasionally we're left scrambling to make sure we've got compensating controls or we wrap another measure. But I think as a rule of thumb, when we've articulated the risk to value, that really drives because otherwise, you know, again, we jokingly as security professionals talk about the insurance sale, right? It's always easier to go position a solution at, or a process after there was a security incident because then people listen. It's that post insurance version. And I think there's just a lot of, there's a lot of onus on us as professionals to make sure we articulate that up front to help avoid that, but to justify it. And there's, there's, it's just not an easy route. It just takes time and passion and commitment to get that so done. It, all, it almost always comes down to an availability of internal labor. Everything you're talking about requires Absolutely. vigilance and a, a process of discipline. But everything about we just talked about for most organizations showed up on the side of someone's desk one day and they're sort of responsible for it. But you're right, visibility is not always there at the executive level because it hasn't been translated into risk, because it hasn't been absorbed by the business at all yet. And so the one of the things that I thought of when you talked about the $8 per month thing, the way this actually happens in organizations is a company is doing its fiscal budget or its two-year budget or five budget, whatever it's doing, you get down to the number that everyone says they need, and then you have to make concessions to meet you know, your, your revenue model or, or whatever. And people say, well, we need everyone to find this much money. And they go back, right? So that $1,300, that could be someone's training budget for the year. So they don't want to cut that. Right. They look at this SaaS thing and they go, oh, you know what? We can probably get by with uh, one account. Then they commit to buying one account, not knowing what the line people are actually going to deal with. Now right. it's three months in and they're sharing the credential. And maybe it's shadow IT to begin with. Well, that... Yep. I, psychology and human nature is why shadow IT exists. <laughs> At the end of yeah. the day, that's where it's driven from. Yeah. So, so how, do, really how, do we, how do we do a better job of delivering that message to our executive in a clear and articulate way? Like, w w Luke, what has your experience been in your organization? Uh, yeah, and, you know, draconian sound, comes to mind. Uh, but no, I'm joking. Uh, you really have to to socialize with the executives, and and I think I think Mark mentioned it really well. When you can actually translate, you know, decision making to risk and so on, that really actually uh, helps executives, uh, you know, support your decision. So the way the way we've we've done it um, is has been really through socializing. Uh, for example, the access policy. Um, we're dealing with, with, you know, all members of the community. So not only the administrators, but the faculty members as well. So they all have to buy in into the access policy. It, it took us almost 12 months to really have it down, down path. But that's, that's the role of IT as well. I, I put that on the onus of the CIO or whoever's leading this, is that you have to socialize. And, but but if, you, if you prepare yourself and you have a decent policy, you will get there. Hey, if I'm able to do it, anybody else can. Uh, and it's just it's just common sense, socializing. Be be your what I call the mayor uh, to really to really defend defend your position. But you got to be patient. That's the thing you talked about. Yeah. When you said that, it made me think of like a website project. Right, we're building one, and sure, we can do it on the weekend and port all the content. But the company doesn't come along with the journey. So mm -hmm. if you create a identity management. You can, you can throw it in and tell them this is what we're using now, but no one heard about it, and now it's Live Monday. 
letting the company absorb it from executive down through management down to the rest of the company can take a year. Yeah, we we um, and and you're right. We, for example, added two factor. Everybody in our community has to have multi-factor authentication. It's turned on. It's required. You can't get around it. And uh, of course, it took a, a little bit of dealing and socializing. But when we turned it on for the last group, students, um, no boo, no yeah, a few a few phone calls, but people get it. And I think and I think this is this is what you know the the reason why we've got CyberX. The reason why we. We are more in tune with cybersecurity and issues and so on. And culturally, I think we're more attuned to take those steps. So it's an opportunity for people like us in leadership positions to say, this is what we need to do. And you just got to make sure you socialize it. So Mark, have we, have we reached the point, are our user bases evolved enough where you know MFA, it's not a nice to have anymore, it's a must to have. That, like, so that's the new baseline. I think people are getting accustomed to it. I mean, if you think of the uh, earlier adopters, people who would have used uh, you know programs like Steam for gaming, they've been using MFA for 10 years, right? right? Other platforms, email platforms, social media platforms especially to stop impersonation and hacking, they're starting to introduce it. Uh, and so I think people are getting accustomed to it in their consumer life. Mm -hmm. But the problem, yeah. just like everything else, right? Just like, a, just like a GIS system for a corporation versus Google Maps, not as easy to use. And so the MFA solutions we're bringing into our corporate levels, not quite as slick yet. And so that's part of it. Uh, and the other part of it is they care a lot more about their personal identity. They care more about logging into their bank than they do about logging into their email system for work. So there's more personally at stake, which comes back to your communication and socialization, Luke. And so and Theo. Just, oh, sorry, no, I just, I just no, want to point ahead. out, point out uh, and Mark, you're absolutely right. And, and what's helping on the education side is that we're more and more being consumerized when you think about it. And that's also what's helping us in our case uh, to, to establish you no know, multi-factor and so on. Yeah, I think one of the things that excites me about hearing this, and I think you're spot on, is having looked at the security industry for 20 years and seeing the evolution, is how security is being woven into the fabric of other elements, right? And you, we... Originally, I think as security professionals, we really saw the immediate win, which was that immediate security element that got added. But you know, hearing to your talk now, I just realized how fundamentally that is embedding it in a, at a young mind and changing what people are really expecting as the, what, where the bar is set. So if I think about six years ago, if I had to roll out an MFA program, uh, it went RSA tokens, try to roll out RSA tokens. Oh my goodness, it was beyond painful to get that integrated and done. And you know, to your point right now, Mark, like, People are expecting it. They're growing up. Your phone has it. Gaming has been having it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's making its way um, into life in a manner that I think is really, really important. Um, I was thinking about this last night because I just, I just got a Pixel 6. I'm moving away from my 3. Yes. And so I'm porting all my authenticator identities, right? So I'm looking at the one that's got the rotating number, and I'm like, I remember when we used to give out fobs, mm -hmm. right? They probably <laughs> yeah. cost more than the phone. Yes. Yep. And now everyone just has it. Yeah. Software token, it's there. And, so and Theo, was, I mean, and, from a from a solutions and a service provider, what is the ask from from your clients? Like, what is the industry screaming for? Well, the um, the, the industry is asking for solutions that balances the difficulty of using versus the security being gained, and doing so at a reasonably price point. So, you know, that's a, it's an interesting ask, but I think the real important part here is for security firms in any kind to work with the organizations to understand that need. Again, we, can't, we have to stop this concept of walking in and prescribing a predetermined solution. Like We have to work with organizations and understand that intent. How is it embedded? Um, are we creating, you know, the other element we talked about is just that buy-in from users. Can we come in and help create an environment where we avoid fear-mongering but we're actually re rewarding people for reporting cyber incidents or if they did something wrong, they should be praised. Uh, you know, if, like my customers are asking of me to keep them secure whenever possible. So we talk about prepare, defend, respond um, at CDW and it's really based off of NIST or ISO. It maps really to any framework, but I, they're asking me to help prepare to avoid any incident. 
Um, they're asking me to respond by putting in the controls and the processes and helping train people to then make that reality. And then they're asking me to respond because the reality is we all know study after study shows 99 to 100% chance that at some stage you're going to experience a form of an incident. And what mitigates the damage and the cost of that incident in your organization is how quickly and effectively you responded and contained. That's really what it's about. Um, you know, we talk about credential sharing, making that so difficult because now how do I know who's that user? Is that really that person? So we have that angle. Um, and then you have the other angle around that whole concept that is just sort of driving home the, I need to empower my users to call me and say, hey, I clicked on a link that I think was suspicious. You need to like, communicate that and make them comfortable right now. It's not a shame and a blame game. It's like it's driving that awareness and telling users you're helping defend us as a uni as a unity. And look, there's no easy. <laughs> we're, we're theorizing here, and like a lot of this is it's just we're not claiming this is a silver bullet, but we have to st set that bar and start chasing it. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. Yeah, and and it, I just want to add a little bit to what Teal said. So, talking about rewarding when people do well, and and how do you reward, and how does it actually relate to our topic here? So we actually do a lot of measurements. Uh, so you know, we, we try to um, catch people in the act and so on. So when we did our first one, uh, we were about 92.7% compliant. Our target was uh, to be at 95%, so meaning that you're not going to fall victim of, of uh, a ransomware, a bad link, or something like that. So we did all the training and everything. And the next time we tested it, we were rated at 99.2%. So that gave us the idea already that, hey, we're, our stature is really good. So our password used to be changed every, uh, every three months. But guess what? We added multi-factor, no, no incident that at least we're aware of. So we relaxed that a little bit more. In fact, I think we went from one month to three months. Mm -hmm. And the users actually notice it, and they're happy. I know, I know, I know it's not a dollar reward, but that's a reward for somebody who's like busy, like the president who says, hey, I, I feel like I need to change my password all the time. Now I, I only have to do it, you know, less. Thank you, you know. So, so and we did get, get that, uh, that feedback, so. Amazing. So we actually just got an audience question come in, and I'm going to turn to Mark for this. Um, just to build off of what Luke was saying. So, you know, often when organizations implement uh, an MFA solution, very often our, our cell phones will be used uh, to get that second factor. But if uh, our cell phones or our mobile devices are lost or damaged, are organizations uh, compensating employees for that cost? Should they be? So that's a sticky question, but it probably depends. My personal philosophy is that if you need your phone, to do your work, then it should be a tool that's supplied to you. Uh, unless there's like a bring your own device policy where you're somehow compensated for it. There are other alternatives beyond using a phone for this. You can use something like a YubiKey or another token of some kind. Because when it comes down to MFA, it's really just, it's more than something you know. It's something you know and have or are. And when I say are, it's not, it doesn't just have to be those biometrics that I didn't like, right? It could just be, you know what, every day, Mark tends to use this service from this location, from inside this building. So I'm not gonna bother him today with MFA. And we're starting to see some of the MFA evolve to be able to do that, where it's using anomaly detection. Sure, it'll still probably challenge you every so often, but not every day if you're doing your normal mark stuff. And with that evolution comes that easy use. Uh, but but my, the, way, the way that I would run things would be, if someone needs a tool to do their job, and we're gonna require it to them, either we give them the right tool, we compensate them in some way for them using their own tool, uh, and there's alternatives, right? There's alternatives that are that are well beyond just having to have a phone. But I'll admit, it's definitely the simplest one. We've seen things like, uh, you know, Bluetooth proximity sensors, uh, fob keys that you'd use to enter the door is the same one. You start to get into an infrastructure cost here, where I really think the phone's the right solution because they can use it when they're at home too. Right. I, I'd like to to add. Uh, our experience. So we we wanted to use the phone, but not everybody has a phone. So we actually allowed the uh, use of PIN. Not the best, but it works. And it turns out that 80% of the users are actually using the PIN. And those that are aware that I want to be more security-minded are using the Google Authenticator in our case. That's what we use. So 
So it's, it's a hard one to answer. Uh, I'm, I'm happy Mark went first on this one because <laughs> it's a hard one to answer. Um, but I, I can tell you that we've tried and we had to offer the PM, which doesn't require anything. So what, what I would do to challenge back again is, because I get it's a budget thing, right? It's, it's a dollars thing. Um, so if you want to protect, you start at the highest level, right? So you start at your place that's not, not even highest in the organization, but biggest risk. People who have access to do accounts payable, uh, people who have access to do uh, HR changes, uh, executives of signing authority that's large, and so forth. And you start that way. And then everyone gets accustomed to it. And you say to them, okay, we would like to do uh, the rest of management now. Uh, and they know what their experience is like. They know they all have phones. And so you can say to them, you know, they don't all have phones. How do you want to do this? Do you want to, do you want to not do them because they don't have phones? Because that's kind of what you're saying when you don't want to buy them the tool. The, yeah, I mean... The reality is you can slice and dice this one a, diff a few different ways. Um, there's a financial aspect to it, obviously, an investment part to it. Uh, the Again, it has to be right size. You, you were hitting on that already. Like if it's high sensitivity users, maybe it's worth giving them a token. Like, Are they logging into sensitive infrastructure? You know what? That's probably severe enough that we want to look at it. Uh, there's other elements that we have, you have to remember too, right? And this is now where it becomes really sticky and it really has to be assessed, such as uh, GDPR. So if you are if you have users that are subject to GDPR mm -hmm. um, or some of the European standards, destroying personal data um, is a criminal offense. So do you want to risk, can I wipe a device? Like if that device has corporate data or information on there and it's a BYOD, can I touch it? Can I wipe it? Like, and, mm -hmm. and you open up a whole... Uh, a box of sticky situations there versus if I issue a corporate device and the end user policy is that this is a corporate device, this is all you are to use it for, um, I can, you know, I can wipe it, I can do certain things there without risking it. And again, we, I'm not, I don't want us to dive into all the different, like the different avenues and channels, but as an organization, I think you, you're spot on, like it comes back to like, what is the risk to the organization in that scenario? And do I justify that to the executives for that specific user as, you know, we should invest funds here to mitigate that? So we might have just started an argument in whatever company the question came from. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, so... But, but I'd like to dive in. Yeah, I'd okay. Like to dive let's, in. let's dive in no, for a moment be, there. Because, because it is a, a really good point. So we, we uh, at Laurentian University do a lot of research. Uh, we, 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 we are, are an undergrad school, but uh, I think we, you know, we do a lot of research for an undergrad school. So intellectual property is really important. Does the university so, keep the IP? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Does the, the university keep the IP? Uh, no, no. The, the, uh, the researchers keep the, but they want to keep it really you know, safe. So um, um, now I forgot what I wanted to say. Thanks, Mark. But uh, that, no, no, it's all good. No, but, but the, um, uh, on the access policy, oh, there we go. I'm getting back to it. Sorry about that. No, that's my um, uh, what we did is we actually uh, put in a suggestion in our, um, in our policy that said, if you're going to use personal data, okay, again, we cannot police it, uh, you know, funding reasons and so on. But if, if you're going to use personal data, we tell them you're not allowed to save any personal data for more than five days on a personal computer. Otherwise, put it in a secure environment, whether it's the private cloud or a cloud that has been sanctioned by the university. And I can tell you that I'm actually so, so happy that uh, at least what I know is that people, researchers that we don't get to police are actually following that. I really like the idea, though, is that maybe be a little bit more draconian for those people with strong access. And that's mm -hmm. something we haven't done because we left it to the user, but I think that's a great idea. So at least what should happen is the, the business, not IT, should make that call. You should bring it to the business and say, here's the risk. We could do this, which is like MFA every time for someone who can, let's say, spend money over $100,000. That's going to be painful for them. We're going to have to have a conversation with them, but it reduces our risk, and it's going to cost us much money. Or we could not do it. But yeah. what often happens, way too often, is that conversation never happens, right. and the business decision makers don't have the risk translated into business for them, and then they don't make the call, and then, it, then the conversation isn't, oh, I remember when we did that. It's, I thought you said we were safe. Yeah, yeah, the, and, and, and sorry, don't know, go for it. No, no, and, and I was going to say, you know, we're having like a discussion here. I, I don't know for people that are listening, but this is kind of cool because, 
you know, especially talking with somebody from an in, a, another industry and somebody, you know, and an expert, um, you know, from CDW about exchanging ideas. But that's that's one of the moral of cybersecurity is you want to socialize with peers. You want to get those ideas because then that's going to really help you decide what are the right things. So when you actually go to an executive, to, it's, it's, it's giving you a good background and, and, and solidifies your position. You know what, and it, again, we're talking about psychology. One of the parts of psychology I love is when you have to put your name to it. The whole game changes. <laughs> so we talk to customers about res risk registers all the time. Let's capture it. Let's articulate it. And let's find the right owner to assume the risk and put their name to it. And you know, to your point, like, you may look at the financial breakdown for that and say, you know, we're going to accept that. And it's one thing to say that in passing or in a meeting and afterwards it was a he said, she said, mm -hmm. who, who pointed this out. But when you have that risk register and somebody has to sign their name next to it, that it's been accepted by the business and by a stakeholder, we find that really helps, that really helps structure it and solidify it again. Um, so definitely, like having that artifact in this whole discussion, can actually we found like really helps drive decisions. Well, I'm so happy you said that because how many of you have a risk register? How many of you have actually have an enterprise risk framework? Mm. That's as important. Yeah. I mean, we say it because it's part of maybe our vocabulary, but that's not necessarily a given. And it's usually, it's because we're we're in some way. Uh, governed by somebody that requires some compliance with whatever X framework. If you weren't, which there's a few businesses that aren't, municipalities are one that has very low, actually, uh, requirements. They have, you know, they have MVIP and they have some, some things that they lift from Papita, but they're not governed by it. So what incentive do they have, other than risk avoidance, which you could pur choose to purchase insurance, some companies will do that instead, um, what incentive would they have to build out a risk program, to have a register, to, to start looking at controls and assigning risks, to even go out and pick what framework should they use? Because, you know, there's lots of places where there's, you're not dictated to use something specific. So I think, I think part of the fear there for organizations, and, and uh, this is, we, we talked, touched on this earlier and that CDW, we are fanatical about it. And I actually know Dan is sitting there smiling, smiling because he's one of the, the front runners of this messaging is again that that concept what scares people about a framework is they look at it and it they think about it uh, in its entirety and mm -hmm. how unattainable it is instead of taking a moment and this is where you work with your security professional your consultants your firm your internal resources and determine why was that rule written and can i and like what we find is the majority of the time 70% of what an organization needs between like process people and technology is already in place for most of these frameworks it just hasn't been considered behind the intent, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so can I take that back and make that feasible? And e even if the 80-20 rule with 20% of the energy, I can read a reach 80% efficiency, and unless I'm held to a standard where I must be ultimate compliant, is that good enough? Is that actually so changing most, my posture? Most of these frameworks will have inside of them, <coughs> yep. do you have default or shared credentials? Do you have a password you policy? <laughs> and do you have back MFA? Back to today's topic. Right? <laughs> and so what I was thinking about, these frameworks that they don't yeah. do is to, is sort your risk cost ever. Yes. I've never seen it where, I mean, consultants will do it, but frameworks when they're published, they'll never say, here's the order you probably should do it in based on risk dollars. And I'm gonna tell you, if you've got default passwords or shared credentials, that's gonna be near the top. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's like not having perimeter protection. Right. Uh, we yeah. call it the fundamentals. Like, we used to call it the basics, and I, I learned to unlearn that word very quickly because a basic implies simple. easy yeah. and simple. Yeah. This is not basic, it's not easy, but it's a fundamental, you cannot be, you know, you do not want to be the security professional that is overseeing a team or a network and get caught without that in place. So, you know, I mean, Theo, so access control, look, it's a foundational control. You all said it in almost any framework out there. I mean, how do we do a better job of organizations collaborating within our organization to get the, that particular message out there? So I think, there's, you know, as a security firm that come in, like sometimes we have the advantage. Uh, like, again, it, like, there's so much tied into the psychology behind security, right? I can tell you one thing, <coughs> but if I bring in another person that has the title expert behind their name, they say the exact same words, 
the audience may behave differently. Like my board may behave differently. And it's frustrating sometimes because as security professionals, you'll stand and you say, but I told you this, and now this person from an external firm or third party or a different credential back is saying the exact same words, and now you're listening and it's making sense. Let me know when you want me to visit. <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. So so I, I think the secret here is like there's times like to balance it. When do we bring somebody in to help drive that messaging? When can it be done internally? And there's times when internally is the right way to do it first. Um, but it just it needs energy. We have to apply energy to it, um, and we have to make it an item of focus. Like that's the only way you're going to drive it. Um, down to the other thing, you know, again, I don't want to over trivialize anything we're talking about. I am is one of my. I have three categories. I am is one of the categories that I've always tell customers it has to live as a program in the organization. You have to yeah. approach it as a program because if you focus on anyone, the people, the process, or the technology individually or independently. It will not. It will not survive. Yeah. If we it were green building something, IAM would come as soon as you install your first metal, right? Absolutely. As soon as you have a switch, you need to start thinking, "What's my IAM?" Yes, you may have a local credential for if all goes bad, Correct. but no one day to day should ever access that thing using some known set of password because when they walk out the building, even just that, it's a nightmare. You have to go change everything because one person quit instead of being able to turn off their access. Yeah. So identity management is so fundamental. But because it was matured after we all set everything up, we Absolutely. have to retrofit everything. So you need like a retrofit program, and you should communicate it that way. All new things will have this. However, we know we've got this over here that's different. Here is our plan and schedule to fix that. And you know, when someone sees, oh, five years out, why is it so long? Well, we don't have the labor to, you know, to put towards it. If you want that to go faster, it's, it's money or, or less work. Or sign the risk places. register. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, guys. I got nothing to add. I totally agree. I, I like your comment, Mark. You know, credentials, that's a perimeter. That's, that's fundamental. That, I like that. So really, it does look like that we need to prioritize this as opposed to it being an afterthought. That's essentially what, what I'm hearing. And is that, is, is that kind of no? Go ahead, Luke. No, I, sorry, Daniel. Uh, yes, I feel very strongly uh, what you just said. I think, I think, uh, credential sharing, I think that should be an exception, not a norm. So therefore, mm -hmm. it has to be going mm -hmm. through a process to be evaluated whether it's really needed. Um, that's the way we do it because um, one is I don't get too many requests, so that's good news. Uh, but I think I think that's where we need to to get to. Uh, and it needs to be a temporary exception <laughs> while I'm figuring out how to get rid of it. Yeah, that's exactly. the right idea. So, yeah. there, no, so there are going to be situations like root password on some appliance where it's shared. Yep. So it should be, that's where I'm okay with it being the crazy impossible to remember password and MFA all the time and notification to your internal security team whenever it's used. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the AAA, right? The, mm -hmm. you want that audit portion. Um, again, I, this trips everything up. If you share that credential and you're not doing it properly and you're not monitoring and aware of it, yep. um, it trips e everything in the steps afterwards gets tripped up by it. You know, and, and Daniel, you, you asked about the prioritization. I, I almost want to take a different approach and say prioritization, again, the wording is the vernacular here, right? But it drives the thought that it's even an option. <laughs> I don't mm. think it's an yep. option. I think it is, yeah, it is a, it's getting up in the morning, you're going to breathe. You wake up, you're breathing, right? It just, it's part of that hygiene. It should just be embedded. Now, we still have to call it something to make sure it doesn't get missed. But I, I, I really feel that, you know, Mark, you said as we're building new things from the ground up, you mentioned it as well, look, like just, has to be embedded in there. It, it's almost, it's common sense, which is not so common. I know that there's all kinds of uh, things around that we see in the security industry, but this might be yeah. one of the places where I'm okay with technology actually prohibiting a behavior because Absolutely. I think the good done by it is just so much better than the, the non draconian approach, right? Like the idea that people have to accept things. This is just a fundamental law of the system. Yes. You can't share credentials. Unfortunately, there are historical exceptions. We'll get to those uh, in some kind of timeline. Right. Hey, we agree. It seems like that. I like <laughs> I'm that. I'm becoming full circle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Theo, I completely agree with you. It really is table stakes. That's the baseline. Um, and, you know, just I can't believe an hour has flown by. So for closing thoughts, you know, Mark, where are where is the cyber world now compared to five or 10 years ago regarding user authentication and credential sharing? Um, are we better? than we were five or 10 years ago? Are we going in the right direction? Or is this going to be a topic that, you know, 
20 years out, we're still discussing. So I think we're going to be better. And it's okay. because now as a business, I feel like I actually have options. There are, there are okay. places I can go to turn this on. Uh, the cloud vendors and other proprietary systems that I work with who historically wouldn't have even talked about this are now presenting options for it. They're not all elegantly connected yet, so the, that's going to be the issue. Again, it's just ease of use. But I think we're heading in the right direction. I think we're, we're orphaning certain systems, though. There'll be some types of, like, for example, uh, industrial control systems and critical infrastructure. They're not there yet. Yeah. Right? So that's, and, and everyone's just sort of okay with that because we've decided, well, that's not a computer. Don't worry about it. So there's exceptions like that that I think we're going to have to work on. But in general, there's a good majority of, that everyone's headed in the right direction. And then eventually it's going to be an example to say, okay, well, we should probably do everything else like that. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know if it's going to take 20 years. It might. Luke, do you agree? Well, so, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, we're, I, I, maybe it's because I'm fortunate that I'm in the academia. Uh, although we'll have people debating, you know, uh, for a long time. But I am so happy with our posture right now in terms of the, the maturity level that we've came. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about IT, but as, as a community regarding the, the credentialing uh, and the multi-factor and so on. So I'm, I'm, I th I, I'm very happy where we're at. Yeah, I think we've gone a long way. I think and Theo, let's bring in your perspective. Um, I think we've come a long way. I absolutely agree. Um, I think we've got an interesting path ahead of us that I'm very excited about. I think there's change, there's new opportunities we've never had. We're working with people. I will, I will put my bet that says in 40 years from now, we're still gonna have this conversation. <laughs> The context would have changed. hundred years ago, yeah. people had rings and wax seals mm -hmm. to you know, signify identity and uh, all the AAA elements. So it's changed over time. As long as humans and technology are interacting, mm -hmm. we're going to have this conversation. But what I'm hoping and what I believe is the friction is going to get less and we're going to rebalance that usability uh, versus intrusion scale, hopefully to the point where it becomes hygiene and a manner that really reduces it. Yeah, and there's no way that use of that seal wasn't delegated to some assistant. Uh, somebody had a ring and there was a copy of a ring. Yep. <laughs> and we, had, we had ring sharing <laughs> hundreds of years ago. So in one way or another, we'll see this again in the future, but I think it's getting the right attention and I think we're working towards the answer. So. Good. good, all right, gentlemen, let's, let's leave it there. Again, I'd like to thank our audience out there. I would certainly like to thank my panel, not only for their thoughts and their perspectives, but also for their time. And for the rest of everybody out there, take care and stay cyber safe. Thank you. Thank you.